Well, welcome everybody today to HydroTerra's webinar series. It's fantastic to see so many people enroll for this one. Really appreciate it. And uh, we have a very interesting speaker talking to us today. It's Philip Mulvey from Environmental and Earth Sciences and Carbon Count to Company Set. And Phil's going to talk to us today about soil carbon farming, background measurement modelling and error. Uh, it's obviously a very topical thing in the environmental space at the moment, being able to measure it because carbon is worth money and we need to solve that big problem of how to start trading it. So before uh, getting into the detail of, of the webinar itself, just a couple of things about our speaker. There's a picture of Phil for you. So a bit about Phil. So I've known Phil for many years. I used to work for Phil and uh, certainly learned a lot from Phil. Uh, he's a great mentor and a very good soil scientist. Uh, he also does a lot of other things. So Phil is a consultant and he's certainly done a lot of work in uh, contaminated land. He's an EPA auditor, for example. But, uh, he's also, unlike many consultants, he's, he's embraced contracting. So he uh, loves being involved in solving problems, not just coming up with a solution, but actually implementing them. He's got a passion for research and has been really proactive uh, in the area of soil science in particular, both lecturing and getting involved in collaborative research. He's an entrepreneur. He's got many businesses that he's set up. And uh, lately he's become an author and uh, he's written a fantastic book which sits on my uh, my bedside table and Phil's insisting that I read it. But there's a picture of the cover and uh, I'd certainly recommend that um, you have a look at that book. Um, in terms of uh, him, he's a proud, he's proud to say he's a soil scientist, uh, except uh, to customs officers as he gets a bit sick of having to clean his boots. But he's had over 35 years of experience practicing soil science, particularly in the landscape scale of things. He remains passionate about the subject and the value of the profession, particularly with regard to their role in landscape repair. Uh, he's been involved in a crazy diversity of projects. It would appear that Phil's got four lives in one. Uh, just a little bit of a sort of synopsis of a few of them. Uh, he's built army bases in East Timor. He's supervised the erection of the largest tent in the UK. He's sold meat pies in the US. He's cleaned up two uranium mines, developed townhouses on landfills, rewrote the manual on oil palm development in Sumatra. So that was for acid sulfate soil side of things has evaluated rehabilitation of the desert in Kuwait, participated in the first green city design in the world, evaluated degraded land on the Monaro, and he has represented Australia in sailing. He currently has several businesses in environmental soil science, whole of farm management, remediation and civil earthworks, and property development in which he has trained numerous scientists, including myself, in the art of commercial scientific problem solving. He's also a father of four and a grandfather, soon to be of four. Uh, his family are undecided whether he is a pain in the ass all the time or only part of the time. Now, these words were given to me by Phil, so I feel comfortable to say that to you. But uh, it's great to have you here today, Phil. Really appreciate you participating in this. I can say Phil is a really uh, forward thinking soil scientist and um, he is what we probably need to help us solve some of these current challenges in this area. Just before we charge into things, we love your questions. As I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, you place your questions in the Q&A section at the top of the screen. Um, click on that and type away. And at the end, 
we will leave some time for questions. Phil has a lot of slides to get through today, but he's promised me that he will get them done in time for us to be able to address some of those questions. Why does Hydroterra undertake these webinars? Well, we love sharing knowledge. We like to facilitate education and we like to help lead the industry. And I think we're lucky here to have a, an industry leader in Phil. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Phil and he's gonna to talk to us about soil carbon farming. Thanks um, very much for the introduction, Richard. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited by Hydroterra, um, a company in which we use their equipment um, both purchase and hire. Um, so there's a, a mutual plug back, Richard. So I do appreciate your role in the industry. Um, so that's the next slide, please, Richard. So Richard's given a great overview of myself, um, somewhat uh, flattering, but the key thing to pick up, which is important to understand the soil aspect, is that um, Environmental Sciences owns quite a few soil sampling rigs and we've been undertaking soil sampling um, commercially for over 30 years. And that's important when it comes to understanding measurement in soil carbon. But we also do, and I'm, as Richard said, I'm an environmental auditor involved in repair of degraded land. So having that experience of audit is also important. Um, next slide, please, Richard. So why the excitement? Um, about um, soil carbon, because sequestering carbon to soil is essential for restoring the climate, but way more than the climate, landscape, community, and actually in saving our civilization. There's quite a few books in the last 30 years that have actually talked about the, the fact that de degraded soil and degraded landscape has led to collapse of most of the previous civilizations. Next slide, please, Richard. What is really important about it, it, it does not just draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, but it also reduces the heat source that causes the earth to heat up. Next slide, please, Richard. Most of you might be familiar with some of the, the, these slides, but these are taken um, from the UNFCCC and the IPCC. In two, 2017, it was estimated that we'd reduce the 1.5 degrees uh, we would get to 1.5 degrees uh, global average heating by 2040. Um, and unless we found a way of reducing CO2, stop it in atmosphere, stopping emissions themselves going up was just, was just not enough. So we have to sequester, we have to actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And the second best opportunity of doing that uh, uh, apart from oceans, is both vegetation and soil. And soil is three times the amount of what you can store in the vegetation. So clearly it's a really important aspect of what needs to be done. Next slide, please. The benefits of increased soil carbon just need to be briefly touched on. And some of these are actually dear to hydrogeologists' hearts, such as, such as Richard and, and Hydroterra, because the offsite impacts of soil carbon through increased infiltration on the farm are significant. You increase baseline river flows, you have less drastic floods, you have less frosts across the district, less hot spells on farm. You have return of a small water cycle with increased effective and total rain in the region. But the benefits to the farm are significant also. So you have decreased cost of sales, which indirectly is obviously more profit. So you you have better water use efficiency, less chemical usage, less fuel due to softer soil and less chemical application and higher yields in average and dry years. Next slide, please, Richard. So what is soil carbon? It's bandied around and people don't fully get what it is. So soil carbon is dead living matter in the soil and it's breakdown products consisting of several overlapping time-dependent pools. Next slide, please. So these three pools of carbon are shown here. The yellow is a labile. It only lasts a short period from hours to maybe a week in the soil. 
The semi-permanent goes from weeks to several years and is the largest pool. And the intractable, being the blue, is last from years to decades and occasionally out to hundreds of years. The balance between mineralization, which is conversion to CO2 in the atmosphere, and humification, which is conversion to soil carbon, varies in every soil and with rainfall events and management. But ultimately under natural systems in the landscape, it reaches a balance where there's a certain amount of humification, a certain amount of mineralization occurring all the time. Next slide, please. Under agriculture, we've proceeded with soil carbon mining. Next slide. So what that actually means is you run from down one, two to three is yes, you have cropping and you have, and you have um, livestock, which are putting carbon in, but that is rapidly mineralized as well. But because it's mineralized, there's no humification under, under the traditional agricultural systems or very little humification except in the very, very wet years, you end up with a circumstance where the demand to move into the labile pool from the intermediate pool increases because humification is not occurring. So you see in slide number one, that's after about two decades, that the intermediate pool has shrunk substantively and the overlap between the pools is reducing. After about um, five decades, 50 years, you can see that um, the mineralization is continued and the overlap gets less and the size of all the pools are decreasing with the labile pool slowly becoming more dominant. Understand the labile pool only lasts up for a week or two. So it's part of the decay process that it will be there even during mineralization. And by the seventh decade, you're having a, a situation where there's almost no overlap in pools and the drawdown from the long-term pools, the intermediates and the intractable, um, barely occurs because there's almost none available to be mineralized. And the labile pool itself is all rapidly mineralized, so it remains slightly larger and more dominant of the three pools. That's the state that most agriculture exists at the moment. Next slide, please. If you proceed with soil carbon sequestration, the following happens. What happens is you start to increase humification and it might only be, you know, one or two percent over mineralization. So um, graphics one, two and three represent approximately one, 10 and 20 years plus. So how do you increase the humification? Because you can see mineralization is still occurring. It's not that you don't get it, you just got to gradually increase the humification, which is associated with um, a slightly lower oxygen demand in the soil because oxygen is rapidly consumed. So you do this by minimizing bare ground. You have multi-species systems. So your pastures are strongly perennial based and diverse and your cropping systems are sophisticated rotation systems. Use alternate fertilizer regime to salts of acids and salts of acids being our traditional manufactured chemicals drive the pH down. And you use mob grazing or seal grazing concepts. And the, and the aspect of what you do there is you only move the stock back onto the pasture when the plant is living off sunlight, not root energy. And you need to get to the second or third tiller stage of the plant before you bring the mob back on. So by constantly grazing, you actually um, diminish the root and diminishes the capacity of the plant to recover. Next slide, please. So that's an overview of soil carbon and the roles it plays. Let's now bump, jump down into soil carbon sequestration as a commodity. Now, interesting, how come Australia leads the way on offsets? Um, and this is quite an interesting question because all we ever hear from um, the various uh, media is that Australia is appalling uh, in carbon. And it's true that um, in terms of the emission reduction race, we're well back in the field, but in terms of the offsets, we're actually the gold medal standard. So let's have a brief look at, you know, 
where we are in stopping emissions. Because Australia's handicapped by energy. We don't have a nuclear energy in our portfolio. Our GDP is heavily dependent, as is our, our employments and obviously our politics, in regard to the fact that our two major exports um, is LPG and coal, you know, with the, the, the top of those three being iron ore. So two of our top three exports are relate to exporting um, energy that uh, does produce greenhouse emissions. And then finally, which is not often talked about, is we're a large country with a small population. And that means all our infrastructure and the cost of infrastructure and laying down of cement on roads and pathways and so on produces CO2 emissions at, at a higher rate than Europe with a much vast, pop, uh, greater population and small amount of roads. So our density in the country means that we must be producing way more emissions and just moving things around. Europe has an inside run in stopping emissions. They use have a degree of nuclear power. I think France is 100% nuclear power and green power, but nuclear power is about 80% of it. Um, they import the power up until recently anyway, um, when Germany is now scrambling, as is in the UK, to, to reconsider um, greater dependency on fossil fuels. They're not a resource-based country, so the GDP associated um, with exporting energy dense um, resources um, or carbon dense resources is not a debate that needs to be had. And they're small countries with very large populations. So they will always be ahead of us in the emissions race. But if you look at the offsets, Australia says, right, well, the only way we can actually compensate greatly is to get involved in offsets, which we did from 2007. Very forward thinking by the Labor government, it was picked up again by the Liberal government and pushed along quite substantively. So both governments is focused on offsets. Now in Europe, offsets weren't even considered until COP26 November last year. So around the rest of the world, USA, Canada, all the world, offsets are only just starting to be considered now and they're looking to the Australian system to do it. It's not reported in Australia that we actually lead the world in our regulated high integrity carbon offsets. Next slide, please. So let's look at the available schemes for both Australia and international um, landholders. Um, in Australia, we have a system that's regulated by the Clean Energy Regulator. And overseas, there are a series of standards that um, have different standard agencies, such as VERA and Gold Standard. New Zealand is probably the only other one that picks up offsets um, and has a, a regulated scheme. Nowhere else in the world are there regulated schemes that pick up offsets. There's certainly schemes for trading, but they don't consider offsets. Next slide, please. So regulation versus standards are really interesting thing because regulation tends to be tightly prescribed. You know exactly that a tonne of carbon in one area should equal a tonne of carbon uh, um, on another farm, one farm to the other, and supposedly, should equal plantation and human induced revegetation, though there are some differences in the quality of that. Um, standards, unfortunately, tend to be a set of principles to be followed. They're not actually tightly regulated or prescribed. So it means that they can be changed more rapidly, but under particular, say, Vera 0042, you can have a 100% model system a model system with some sampling or an intense sampling system, and they all comply with the principles set down. The outcome of this is the integrity of the standard has to be tested by the purchaser with every purchase, where an ACU is at least as known as having the highest integrity worldwide, as I said, ignoring the domestic publicity we've received recently. Next slide, please. Surprisingly enough, we are being asked frequently by overseas customers to provide an ACU equivalent through VERA um, registry. So there's a move in the world to have a tightly measured system that's highly um, prescribed and people understand what it's worth. Next slide, please. So let's look briefly at finding the most applicable offset methodology. 
offset principles. So the offset principles are set worldwide, nothing to do with Australia, are the following. There must be an additional practice done that wouldn't happen without the revenue from carbon. It needs to be verified, i.e. monitored, reported, and then finally verified by a credible third party, i.e. an auditor. It must have permanence that will not be reversed. It must be measurable according to scientific data through a recognised methodology, and it can't go, you can't actually increase emissions in order to achieve the sequestration. So you've got to avoid leakage. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry that that shrunk up. It shouldn't have happened, but that's okay. Um, steps to maximizing your carbon opportunities. This applies for all methods. Um, you need to reduce the error associated with assessment. That's all methods. The soil carbon method, understand the controls of carbon sequestration to make sure that you achieve permanency. Reduce emissions associated with all the activities you do and ensure reversal does not occur and permanence is achieved. Next slide, please. Let's look briefly at model versus measurement. It's interesting when you start to look at how models were derived and what models are about. Models look at flux. That's the, the change in concentration with time. And models were designed initially at 150 mil. They were calibrated on sampling to 150 mil and they were verified um, by sampling again at, to 150 mil of depth from the surface. Accuracy and variance is not so important. Modeling requires, as a result, minimal ver verification, and modeling is focused on carbon concentration distribution maps for farmers to use. So they actually are concentration distribution, which is a lot easier to achieve through modeling. Trading carbon, on the other hand, is a minimum depth of 300 mil. Now it's important to understand that the two major models in the world, um, which is the DASET model, um, which is um, commercialized through a Comet Farm and uh, Roth C model, both are done to 150 mil for carbon management. They're not done to trade carbon on a mass basis to 300 mil or to a meter. In those instances for trading carbon, accuracy and, various, and variance matters hugely. And what you record is the mass of carbon to a depth per legal title. It's not concentration based. And the models are yet to be confirmed with sufficient precision to actually have a low variance. They're not yet designed for mass, but are focusing on the flux. Next slide, please. So, Verification and measurability, or at least the variance of measurability, is a huge problem for models. Every commodity in the world is traded on measures. So why do we expect carbon to be different? And the appropriate measurement is more profitable than the use of modeling as more carbon at a higher value can be produced for the trade. And there's the one example on that is small countries with, with minimal variation in soil type under wet environments. So let's look at now how to reduce your error of measurement. So error for those involved in sinus in the room is pretty simple. It comes from four things. One is being representativeness. Sorry about the slides marked up on the transfer. Um, two, Precision, three accuracy, and four error management. But the latter three, which are in, in larger script rather than the smaller script of, of the, the former, are at least a one hundredth of the importance of representativeness. So representative of farm and sample is just the most important thing to achieve. Next slide, please. So for store carbon, the greatest variance is caused by representativeness, and that means where you have to sample and the number of samples you need. And it involves a fairly complicated process um, that goes through stratifying, creating star carbon stock maps and the like. Next slide, please. And this can only be done by machine learning. Understanding the controls of carbon sequestration, soil carbon. Next slide. 
It's important to, to consider and understand the fact that um, in regard to the soil carbon method, that you have systems constraints, systems controls, and management controls. Next slide. The system constraints are rainfall. Rainfall decides the rate of carbon sequestration. You can't sequest more than the water available to grow plants. Very important thing to understand. The second thing is the maximum amount you can sequest is decided by the charge of the soil, the cation exchange capacity. And the third thing is those two above assumes that your management practices optimize the rate. Next slide, please. It is possible in systems controls to play around with effective rainfall and cannot exchange capacity, but they tend to be long-term and expensive. So the key thing to focus on, next slide, is the management controls. So the issue about management controls is you have to promote increased humification over mineralization, which means you have to have effectively the right balance in pH with somewhere between six and a half and eight. Um, and the reason for that is in Australia, a high degree of cation exchange capacity in agricultural land is, control, is controlled by what's known as pH variable charge. So pH is important. And every time we take organic matter off by a stock or crop, we lower the organic matter, which lowers the buffering of pH. And whenever we add acid, fertil, oh, salts of acids um, in fertilizers, we also drop the pH. So we need to ensure that we buffer the system back. The next thing to understand is all human cells have a ratio of carbon, nitrogen, phosphate, and sulfur. So to sequest carbon, it's not enough just to go with a bit of water, sprinkle a bit extra water on the way you go. You actually need to provide the same ratio of the carbon you want to sequest of nitrogen, phosphate, and sulfur. And they're best provided. Nitrogen can be by legumes and nitrogen fixing um, plants of different sorts, um, but mostly by legumes in our system. Phosphate can be provided by manures, but for Australia, we have way too great a demand in our system for phosphates that can possibly be met by manures and composts. It is possible also to move to rock powders um, and without going into that, that, there's a lot more required, but it is now available to be able to use rock powders to provide uh, your phosphate. Uh, if you continue to use um, salts of acid fertilizers, then there has to be a correction of pH. The next most important thing to achieve is to ensure the fungi exceed bacteria. In most of our systems, we have way low counts of fungi. Bacteria dominate, and when they dominate, they tend to push mineralization over humification. We also need to minimize macroporosity, which allows fast um, venting um, of uh, uh, CO2 and great input of oxygen. And we need to maximize infiltration, so we need to avoid bare ground and compaction. So the key point that soil carbon is a crop with a long time period before sale and retrospectively can degrade. So soil carbon farming, just looking at the things that you're required internationally to achieve, additionality or the newness factors as called by the CER. Now, regardless of what you think can stop um, CO2 uh, uh, equivalent em emissions, such as a inhibitor of nitrification, these are the only ones allowed by law currently in Australia. Those highlighted are the ones most often used by farmers. And anyone who has already commenced regenerative practices, because of the ruling internationally that there has to be an additional factor to that currently practiced, those practitioners that started early are penalized by the fact they can't claim the carbon unless they make another modification as noted on this list of one to 13. Next slide, please. So leakage, next slide. Basically, you've got to look very carefully, not only at your sequestration, but what are your on-farm emissions and ensure that you don't go above the baseline. Next slide. So that means accounting for 
the nitrous oxide, the methane, the carbon dioxide, the fuel, um, the electricity, um, all your potential em emissions on farm need to be accounted at the baseline at, at the measure at the next measurement or trade of carbon. Next slide, please. Permanence is addressed mostly at the government level. Next slide, please. So we're looking at permanence on reversal, like drought um, and change of practice um, occurring on the farm. And then the permanence is addressed via regulation and, and using activities that achieve permanence. Next slide. So what the government actually does is to ensure that they address this. Next slide, please, Richard. Is that... Um, they actually give a discount, um, apply a discount to the carbon you achieve, 5% for risk of, of, of reversal, and a permanency discount of 20% that you're not achieving a permanence. If you can demonstrate at the end of your 25 years of permanence is, ach is achieved a certain degree, you'll be able to claim a portion of that. Next slide, please. Just briefly looking at returns. Returns obviously come from carbon trading, but I just want to briefly look at the increased profitability production and extreme event resilience. Because some farmers have actually had huge benefits from these and started early on doing that before carbon trading is possible. So here's a farm that we've, two farms have been monitoring for 15 years. This is one that started the 500 millimeter rainfall zone, which is mar just getting to the very edge of mar margin for cropping. And you can see that at the start, when there was 65% water utilization efficiency um, and the carbon was low, the, the farmer achieved on an average year only a surplus of 7,000 um, after the family taking income of 80,000. By the end of the 15th year, which is the, the third column along, the farmer had gone up to a, a surplus after tax of 260,000, a huge improvement with the, fa with the family taking out 146,000. But the water use efficiency was close to maximum, 95%. That's what carbon does. Next slide. If you go to the more common areas of 600 mil um, cropping lands, because people believe you can't sequester carbon under cropping. Um, but this shows not only you can, but the, the returns that are achieved over 15 years of improvement in water use efficiency that comes about from increasing carbon. So again, we've gone from 65% to 95%. And we're seeing the fact that the surplus after tax has gone up from 228,000 to almost 700,000 with the farmer increasing their, their take home um, income by 50,000 as well. Surprising enough, land in both Colcan and uh, left them um, 12 months ago, I haven't checked recently, was valued at much the same price in dollars per hectare. Next slide, please. The other aspect can come up is not just improved profitability, um, but in return of the small water cycle. This is a photograph of the rabbit proof fence in Western Australia, showing that um, vegetative lands and a, a, a lack of, sorry, a reduction in what's called sensible heat um, has re resulted in a huge amount of cloud formation over the green areas, which is pastoral, and the other side of the rabbit fence, which is cropping, you can see the difference quite clearly. So the return of the small water cycle is, is a key feature that comes out from carbon. Next slide, please. Here's an example from Tweed Heads um, during um, the late winter. Uh, when sugarcane was harvested and a, a particular additive to increase the degradation of the, to organic matter of the, the cane um, trash uh, resulted in a huge amount of microbial activity keeping the, the soil and the trash over the soil slightly warmer resulting in, in a mist overlying the land. Next slide, please. The business modes, what are they? Because you hear a lot about these different approaches. So what we have for those that are involved, and this is just costing based off the carbon count um, SaaS platform, is the farmers can do a self-managed approach, there's a co-op approach, there's the project manager approach and the aggregator approach. Um, most in the market go with the aggregator approach to date, where you're looking at um, the fact that the aggregators um, take a much larger commission and don't charge a hell of a lot um, to the farmer of the costs along the way. 
but the cost to the farmer also include infrastructure costs um, to alter the farm and, and they're of a variable nature. So if you look at, at the, that's the top end of the scale in terms of, of taking um, of a significant amount of the profit at the end of the day of, of the commission on trade, 25 to 40%. If you look at self-managed farmer, um, the costs on the platform and running all the contractors are in the order of 60 to 100K over the life of the trade. Um, close to 60 if you're using the platform properly. If you're not using the platform, there's a lot of manual labor you've got to pay for. It's closer to 100. The infrastructure costs are variable, um, but the commissions are in the range of less, less than 5%. So there's quite a difference depending on which particular model, you, business model you choose um, as a farmer. Next slide, please. In summary, I hope you took some notes, um, but the key point to remember is that increasing soil carbon is fantastic for landscape, community, as well as climate change. And that results in saving our civilization from further degradation that's occurring. So that's the key point out of it. It's not just about having the opportunity to trade, but it is, it is to improve the local landscape. Next slide, please. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Phil. That uh, was excellent. Uh, very comprehensive. Look, we have a lot of... Um, quite a few early bird questions. So I'll probably uh, skip along a little bit here. I think a couple of key points. Um, soil carbon is a crop with a long time period before sale and it can retrospectively degrade. So that is a concern and certainly feel I felt that this requirement of it not being reversible versus all the schematics you put up which show that carbon is in fact reversible. It's just got me a little bit intrigued about the linkage between those two things. Um, that's probably something come up in. Maybe I'm happy to respond that very quickly now, Richard, is that um, it is, it's not to do with the fact it's reversible or not. As long as you maintain the practice, humification um, will result in the pools increasing. So the key thing is the practice, not so much that the fact uh, is it's, um, it's readily reversed with drought or reversed with um, poor practice. That's the flux rate, the total mass that counts, um, not necessarily um, where it sits in the different pools. And the second dog point that I've haven't got on here that was interesting was just the relation between effectively plant available water or, or moisture and the ability to actually sequester carbon. So it doesn't matter how hard we try, if we don't have that moisture there, we're kidding ourselves, which I thought was pretty important to understand. Uh, in terms of measurement, which is obviously where Hydroterra is focused as a business. The world of sensing is edging closer to having portable sensors to do this, but they don't exist yet. So we're still tied to laboratory analysis. Um, there's certainly opportunities with spatial analysis with satellite um, data to be able to look at the effectiveness of the land uses, but you can't bank against it. Is that right, Phil? It's, um... Yeah, there's, there's no doubt there's a strong correlation in using um, Landsat imagery associated with the vegetation or red index to predict what's going on. And it's a useful assurance measure, um, but to actually trade, um, it doesn't have precision or, uh, or accuracy associated with the variance is, is quite significant. So even if you take an R squared of 0.95, that means you, your variance is, is somewhere around 15%. So um, if you keep, and an R, you know, very few um, 
models will get better than R squared of 0.98, which is where you actually need to be. Okay, so I think we'll get into the early bird questions. Thanks very much for everyone who's sent these through. And then uh, I'll move to the ones that are sitting in the Q&A. So what are your thoughts on practice changes that are applicable through the, I'm going to get through my, through the Australian Soil Carbon Protocol or VERA? And does this have room for nitrogen reduction and or elimination? Look, um, most of the practice changes um, have been through a rigorous scientific review panel. I've, I've sat on two of them um, to, to get practices approved. Um, it's unfortunate that um, there is benefits for changing fertilizer application you can use. That's one particular method. But the method for using nitrification inhibitors whilst increasing your nitrogen fertilizers, which can result in reduced nitrous oxide emissions, which seems ironic, um, has not been actually accepted because though there's good scientific research to say that um, nitrification inhibitors do drastic re reduce in most instances, not all, but in most instances, nitrous oxide emissions, that methodology is still under discussion. So it might be a year or two away before that's accepted in any method. Okay, so the next question, do you think satellite-based assessments, assessments of annualized biomass provide a reasonable proxy for actively occurring soil carbon sequestration? Uh, yes, they do. Um, for the top 150 mil or so, what's going on deeper is, is a little bit uh, more difficult. So you do actually need some measurement to calibrate um, your Landsat to pick up um, what's going on deeper, but it, it's only a proxy. It's not, so it's an assurance tool um, based on um, particularly plant available water or water use efficiency as well. So it becomes a very good assurance tool um, rather than actually a trading tool. It's important to understand as I tried to set out the difference between farm management practice and trading. The two are quite different. So it's very good for farm management, not so good at all for trading. So do the uncertainties of soil carbon distributions in the soil provide problems for benchmarking sufficiently to reliably underpin financial decision-making? Yeah, this is where what I didn't say at the outset is that um, we're funded three PhDs to look at a new type of geostatistics that underpins what we do and is actually the basis of the 2018 and 2021 Australian um, soil carbon method. Um, though uh, we licensed the, the easy part of it, but held back the more difficult part. So the issue here is that best way to describe this um, is uncertainty is reduced by unequal area stratification using um, features of pedogenic commonality across the landscape. So what that means is um, if you've got the same geology and the same topography and aspect and the same vegetation, it's logical to expect that, that the, the carbon distribution would be smaller if that was considered as one population rather and then you've got a series of other common populations and you analyze them all as one population adding up the means and adding up the um, the variances and when you compare to look at the whole farm as a single population the variance is going to be much much greater so so that is the approach taken by the new type of geostatistics. And yes, it does produce a variance, no doubt about it, but that variance means that you take the lower point, of the variance on the second um, measurement you do, and the upper point of the baseline or the first measurement that you do, and that's the amount you trade. So that can be traded with surety. So yes, it is a sufficiently reliable system for financial decision-making. It's not soil carbon distribution that we are 
making our financial decision on at all. It is actually soil carbon mass. Still sub subject to the same problem though. Not quite. Um, we're not concerned about distribution from a trading point of view. We're simply just concerned about the total measurement of mass, uh, sorry, of mass and its variance. And we only trade the component we're certain of. We don't trade the component we're uncertain of. So this is the problem with models is the variance is so much greater that there's almost, well, there is nothing left to trade effectively. Uh, um, and so that's, that is the issue related to soil carbon is you can only actually trade the difference between the, the upper and lower variances of the first and second measurement. Okay. Um, in terms of not on the list, just a little sneaky question, I suppose. So you mentioned earlier about the ratio between fungi and microbes in the soil and how if, uh, if it's microbially, you know, dominant, that effectively we're getting a lot of mineralization, therefore loss of, of the carbon out of the system. Is that factored in at all in these assessments of, you know, the actual carbon number or doesn't it matter as such? Um, when the soil's dominated by bacteria, chances for humification are less than when they're dominated, when the microbial population is dominated by fungi. Um, Without fungi dominance, you're not going to greatly increase humification, but you don't need to measure microbes to do that. You can actually simply do standard um, penetrometer tests or standard soil texture tests, or even just start to get to know your soil to see that the carbon is increasing. Um, so it's not necessary to do a lot of microbial investigation to do it. Um, the method, uh, the soil carbon, 13 methods um, all as assume they will impact um, the micro microbial or, or the soil biome with time and result in humification occurring. So the measurement itself is based on um, two lots of measurement and the difference you, and you trade the difference after considering the variance. So you don't actually have to confirm that humification is occurring because you only trade the carbon that has been sequestered. Okay, so how viable in central Australian cattle stations? Well, <laughs> moisture is much lower. So rainfall is much, much lower. Sequestration can occur with change in practice, but it's very slow and the amount you can sequester is not that high. But because the area is so great, um, it's certainly viable to undertake. And we've uh, got quite a few properties that we're doing at the moment. Um, soil carbon sequestration in Central Australia. But there's no point doing, you know, frequent, unless you're in, in the uh, wet years at the moment, there's no great point in doing frequent um, analysis or frequent measurement and you typically should be leaving it to five years rather than three years. Can the financial benefits of carbon farming be better distributed? Yeah. Um, yes, probably, but at the moment so few farmers have started because of the costs of starting. It's a question of not so much the financial benefits better distributed, but can the cost be more evenly distributed to um, uptake? Because the financial benefits are significant off farm, as we've just talked about. Um, so the off farm benefits relate not only to climate, but to very localized impacts of return of the small water cycle, um, less intense floods, um, less intense hot spells, et cetera, et cetera. Why estimate soil carbon when you can measure it? <laughs> um, I'm with you on this, um, but there is a reason. We actually do, we run models to work out where to sample based on those models. And once we use that, that reduces the cost of sampling. You can also have 
you know, 5,000 samples in a given area and produce a worse answer than 300 samples or even 100 samples. Because if the 5,000 samples aren't done in relation to improving your population statistics, you can end up with quite, still quite a significant variance. So it's not so much measuring higgledy-piggledy or on a square or a grid basis. It's more a matter of measuring on the basis um, of stratification, so the variation in the landscape. And to help derive that, you do actually run with a estimate of occurrence of soil carbon across the landscape, and that requires modeling initially. So yes, we, we do estimate the distribution of soil carbon on that basis, work out which of those soil carbon ranges are gonna have the smallest um, uh, variance and then split up the number of strata accordingly. So the reason you estimate soil carbon is to reduce the variance associated with measurement. All right. How, I'm not quite sure this, how the soil carbon farming is practiced and a minimum size. So what's the minimum scale to undertake soil carbon farming? Um, well, that's a really interesting question. The minimum size is not always a matter of what carbon trading is worth. That sugarcane farms 90 acres. And in the last three years, it flood, it's flooded significantly in Tweed Heads every year. He is the only farmer below two metres AHD, so in the, in the lower floodplain, that's got a, a crop off at almost full potential every year. And that is a result of soil carbon. Um, so the measurement of soil carbon and understanding where to improve it on his farm even though the farm only has a 20 centimetre variation in height across his whole farm, that information has resulted in the fact that he has probably um, achieved another $360,000 to $400,000 in the last three years through carbon management. So it depends why you're doing soil carbon uh, management. If you're doing it just to sell, then it's a combination of how much you can increase your soil carbon versus land size to overcome the costs of it, to get the quantity of carbon needed. But that should not always be the main reason for doing it. So that same farm in Tweed Heads had soil carbon that varied from 1.9% to 8%. So if he was able to lift the mean up to somewhere around 6 or 7% from the current gross mean of about 2.5%, then he's got an increase of of somewhere in the order of 4% carbon, which would be unheard of in the drier areas where you'd be lucky to get 1% carbon increase. So therefore the small size of the farm, the opportunity to trade um, is in his case, quite um, viable at scale. But the main benefit came from him was not, not the carbon value, but the actual improved uh, yield he got because of his flood resilience. Okay. Um, why does soil organic matter? Why, why did soil organic matter not exceed 3% after 40 years of organic farming? People confuse organic farming with sustainable farming. Um, every civilization prior to about 1940 that collapsed due to agricultural misuse were all organic. So let's not get overly confused with the concept between organic and the use of manufactured chemicals in farming. Organic farming is often not sustainable because they are continuing to mine the organic carbon from the soil without having practices necessary to return it. So just because you're organic doesn't mean you're sustainable. Many organic farms are, but not all undertake sustainable practices. So it is important to, to understand the two don't equate. Um, and in many civilizations, all, almost all agricultural civilizations and all civilizations failed in the past because of um, agricultural misuse in the landscape. Organic farming 
is no different if it doesn't consider the, the sustainability fact that it has to maintain or increase organic carbon. Um, so I have no problem that even after 40 years, it was only 3% because the focus wasn't on um, increasing humification. The focus was on not using manufactured and the objectives are quite different and the outcomes are quite different. Makes sense. Uh, next question, spectrometry for soil carbon measures. What is the current status of such tool utilisation in the field? Look, there's at least seven commercialisation projects going in Australia at the moment on this. There's probably another 30 or 40 worldwide. Um, there's a variety of tools that use a variety of spectra, but mostly um, mid-range infrared. Um, some use variable light spectras and comparisons. Some use uh, lasered mid-range infrared. Um, so there is a variety that occurs. At the moment, um, though some of the this, this spectrometry is getting up with R squared values you know, 0.85 or higher. Um, they have to be calibrated for every field and the methodology required by the government requires 30% lab analysis for calibration. A single researcher has yet commercialized, um, though there is one overseas called Yardstick, which is getting close, has commercialized Uh, in-field spectrometer that can be driven to a meter and do readings of both bulk density and carbon either on the way down or on the way back. That is the ultimate goal. Um, it's not available yet. It will certainly uh, be a, a routinely available, I, I think, within three to five years. So spectrometry association with soil carbon is strong. Um, it's not yet... Um, rigorous enough to survive in the field. The, uh, the sensors themselves, um, both the emitter and the, re the recorder, have, don't survive well with vibrations. There's a lot of people working on this. There's a lot of money going into it. So, so there's quite a few different um, commercialization research institutes involved. Um, it will be cracked and be commercially viable and be cheaper than the labs within two or three years, maybe, maybe five. But at the moment, it's not cheaper than, than physically sending out a person, taking a sample and sending it to the lab. But, it, but it's coming. Do you think, it's uh, not a question here, but do, you, do you think uh, it's easier to monitor the land use change than it is to try and come up with this fixed number for carbon in the soil? Wouldn't we be better off to be pushing for direct measures of at that sort of management level. Look, this is the, U the approach of the US, the previous approach in Canada and the approach in New Zealand. Um, the problem is that farmers are so variable in their practice and they might say, you know, this is the following practice we're doing. Um, and you can run some assurance through Landsat um, that it's very hard to actually trade into the market with confidence an individual farm. At the government level, you can trade a portfolio that's going to have below and above the mean, and you can do it on that basis, which is what New Zealand government has approached it as at a portfolio level. But if you're trading in an open market, in fact, let me put it another way to you, Richard. Would you you're with a couple of mates, you, you play poker and you, you're sitting across from the pub in a foreign country in, in a room on the first floor and you've got a set of binoculars and you've got to order some beer. Um, so you take your binoculars, you can see there's three different glass sizes, you don't know what they are, it's hard to estimate what they are, and you don't know the language except you know what brown liquid, so you want to order for beer, but you've got to be careful what you get. So you could get ginger beer, you could get full strength beer, you could get low alcohol beer, you could get no alcohol beer, and you could get a you could get a, a midi, a schooner, or a pint, and they could be half full or completely full. It's hard to estimate, even with your binoculars, because there's people moving backwards and forwards and so forth. 
So there you are standing remote with your binoculars looking out and you're going, well, I can run the chance that based on the statistics I get from the Bureau of Meter, uh, from the, uh, um, the, the government statistics that um, the so many pubs produce X amount of ginger beer and Y amount of full strength and Z. So I can run an average and just take a punt or I can order a standard glass with a standard measure of alcohol um, and be told that, you know, if I buy this beer, it's actually got 5% alcohol at um, uh, a pint level, uh, 600 mil, and I know exactly what I'm getting. So most people buy, in fact, everyone buys commodities on measures, but governments use models to estimate what populations are doing. So as an individual buyer, are you gonna run with a model, Richard, when you order your beer? Or are you gonna buy by a measure? Well, it depends on the accuracy of the measure, right? And you say you're looking at the variance. Um, I'd probably buy a beer based on my binoculars, but that's probably not <laughs> the answer you were thinking of. <laughs> no wonder you get drunk so often, but anyway, move right along. <laughs> Hey, yourself. Uh, next question. How we estimate carbon in soil of closed mine sites and incorporate it to successfully, to successful rehabilitation and revegetation? I think, can we, I think, can we use this as an approach probably to get some revenue for rehabilitation? Look, you can in the buffer zones, but because mines are regulated to rehabilitate, it's not a newness factor. So even though um, getting organic carbon into tailings and onto waste rock is actually absolutely essential um, to, to making an artificial topsoil by composting and things, um, to stopping uh, weed invasion, um, it's required by the license and therefore is not an additional factor that depends on the income from carbon sales to do it. So therefore under international regulations, the mine closure rehab is not eligible. But the buffer zones are eligible. Right. Good. Um, we're now over to the Q and A sessions. We're a little bit over time. Are you okay with us going a bit longer, Phil? Oh, I know. I'm not too sure if anyone's still there, Richard. So that's probably the first thing to check. There's there's yeah. 93 people still left, Phil. Ah, oh, gee, they're just probably asleep and forgot to switch off. I'm happy to take questions, Richard. Okay. Does biochar fit into the equation? Yeah, biochar is really interesting, um, as is um, periodic burning for charring in, um, in the pastoral zone once every five to eight years or so. Um, biochar, after six months, attack in the soil by fungi becomes charged. And it's one of the few ways you can increase the CEC of a soil, albeit... Um, for shorter duration than mineral increase, but it's one of the few areas you can you can increase the charge. So it, it is definitely uh, a benefit to use, but currently methodologies don't yet consider that uh, as um, a worthwhile means of increased sequestration. But we're hoping that uh, with time will be considered providing you take away the embedded carbon and that is associated with the charring. So yes, it is a stimulant to further um, sequestration in low charged pH variable soils. Okay, there you go, Locke. Um, Thanks for the presentation, Phil. Are you advocating measurement only, Schedule 1, as opposed to model and measure approach, 
Schedule 2? Um, I'm not, both Schedule 1 and Schedule 2, uh, we do and we do successfully for clients because Australian system does have measurements in it. Schedule 2 requires calibration of the model um, with um, at least three measurement events before you can rely on the model alone. Um, what I am advocating is for the most amount of carbon using modelling to work out where to measure and then following with measurements and then modelling again to work out where to measure the second time round gives you the smallest variance and therefore the most carbon to trade rather than calibrating a model and then just moving forward on the model. So it, it's still a personal choice because the people think that the cost of measurements is substantively less, so substantially more than the cost of modeling. It turns out that's not the case. And the reason being to understand the economics of sampling. So if you send a sampler out to sample three samples to um, validate a model, it costs the same as sending a sampler out to do 70 samples to 30 centimetres or 40 samples to a metre, which is about what you need for a thousand hectare farm on a properly derived sampling program. So in terms of the average farm, close to the average size farm in Australia, the cost of sending a person out to sample is the same whether you model or whether you measure. The only difference at the moment is the lab costs and they will come down as spectrometry um, starts to become more widely, or more widely available. Um, I'm not necessarily advocating one over the other, um, they're both approved methodologies, but I suspect that the return actually means that when you're relying on your trade solely on measurement um, as the final arbitrator, you may well use modeling to work out where to sample, but if you're relying on two measurements, then um, the market will value that more highly and the variance will be less so you'll have a higher integrity more carbon to trade but this will be decided in the future so it'll be interesting to see what happens seems a little bit of a flaw um if if you say every five years you go and do your your soil tests and you've done all this good work as a farmer and you've effectively been sequestering carbon for say four of those five years and then on the fifth year you have a drought and your numbers plummet and you come along and do your soil tests uh wouldn't we be better off wouldn't it be fairer and more practicable that to be rewarding the management practices that held on to that carbon for the four or the five years no not yes and no the answer is that a well-managed system won't result in a plummeting of carbon during a drought. It might be a slight reversal. It might just be steady during the drought where um, most of the neighboring farms that aren't undertaking those practices will end up with a lot of macro porosity. Um, they won't carry their moisture into the drought for 12 to 18 months. They will lose it very quickly within a couple of months. So they'll have to destock um, and they'll end up with a degraded landscape with, with as you've indicated, carbon plummeting. If you've undertaken um, appropriate practice, you'll find that the levels of carbon that reduce on the environment, th those drought-based situations are way, way less than the adjoining farms. Um, they won't necessarily plummet, they might just stabilize or cut back five to 10%. So the previous four years will have given you the carry through and so if you're in the situation that you, if you sample on the fifth year, you can sample any time between the three and fifth year under the government's methodology. So if you sample at the fifth year um, and you've had two years of drought before that, you won't get a 100% you know, penalty of the three years that you've sequestered carbon, but you will have some. And the, the international requirement is to actually have um, you know, uh, a demonstrated measurable uh, sequestration. Um, 
And so the fact is that if you've gone backwards for two of the five years and that's the measured amount, that's the way it is. But I can assure you that if you hit the drought at the fourth and fifth year, you'll be way more uh, as a farmer um, financially better off than the farmers that haven't done it at all. So um, next question. Do you know how many tonnes have already traded due to Australian farmers under this national protocol? And what would that represent among land management trades in the world carbon market? Well, Australia by far, in terms of farm, has the, most, the greatest number of trades in the world. We started early and we continued. I haven't checked the soil carbon. So there's a variety of methods, but let's just look at the soil carbon methodology. Um, a few months ago, and I haven't checked most recently, there was 350 registrations of projects. Now, it's a bit confusing because not every project's a whole farm and some projects can be several farms. Um, so there is some degree of confusion in there. But if you were to take the fact there's about 140,000 farms in Australia under, with tax, tax deductions, and let's assume about 80,000 of those or 85,000 of those are, are full commercial farms where, where substantively, if not all, their income comes from the farm. And if you look at that roughly, say, 350 to 400 that are now registered, we're at the point of half a percent of the commercial farms in Australia have undertaken it. So we're still at the point of just moving out of the innovators into the early adopters. So it's, it's still early days yet. Is there a register though? Like a oh yes, yeah, I mean, it's available to the public. Anyone can, can um, jump, jump into the CER, the, the Clean Energy Regulator. Um, they can look up um, the uh, carbon offset register. Um, which has got over 1,400 projects or 1,500 projects total register at the moment. They can then sort for soil carbon on that register and you should come up with 350 to 400 and the rest will be HIR and plantation mostly and Savannah burning so that, so that they're the four dominant ones, plantation less so. Um, and then there'll, there'll be also things like landfill gas and so on, which is 20 or so. So you can actually, go in and do a sort and look at which of the offset technologies Australia uses. And soil carbon um, was literally, you know, two years ago was none. And now it's 20% you know, of registrations. Okay. Um, can we also apply legumes at degraded soils at mine sites as part of land rehabilitation or is this only for agricultural farm management? Oh, look, um, legumes are essential and most mines do apply, um, particularly native legumes in their rehab schemes. Um, to get to ecosystem balance, you do need to get rapidly to nitrification. Um, surprising enough, the Australian system is actually dominated by ants and not worms. So uh, particularly most mines are in the desert country. Um, the ants, uh, uh, particularly white ants, are, are great sequesters of, of nitrogen as well. Um, so you do get in our system both ants um, and lemons, but also acacias and cacharinas are uh, nitrogen fixing. So as long as you've got multi-storied systems looking to sequester nitrogen, um, the grasses um, and the non-nitrogen fixing shrubs can benefit from, from those. So you might use a little bit of nitrogen to get started, but after that you would um, leave it to the dynamics of your nitrogen fixes to help those that, that don't have it. So the reason why um, weeds are able to colonize quicker and the reason why after fires acacias get going quicker is they actually have nitrogen fixation on the roots and that's why they get going in what is basically a fairly poor soil. So I think the short answer is uh, yes, I can. <laughs> so, um, I should have given <laughs> short answers, not long answers. Yes. No, no. Um, so we'll have a couple more questions, maybe um, 
we'll finish up at 1.30, I think. Uh, oh, sorry, at, uh, we'll maybe give it five more minutes. Um, so what are the effects of soil temperature on carbon sequestration and respiration? Um, this is not a yes, no question. Um, soil temperature results in faster respiration and faster degradation. So in the tropics where you've got a very, um, a lot of rainfall, you'd expect a lot of sequestration, but often you end up with what's known as pallid or leach soil, um, where um, the organic acids get washed down and leach soil of nutrients and most of the organic matter stays in, in the top 150 mil. Um, so effectively you're doing a, dealing with a system that is operating on a mineral, it's mineralizing so quickly that there's no opportunity for humification. Mineralization is important. We don't want to stop all mineralization because that ends up with peat. Um, but we do want um, humification to um, have some degree uh, in the soil, you know, somewhere around 5% of total organic matter uh, that appears in the soil. Um, 95 gets degraded, but if 5% keeps getting humified, you end up increasing the soil organic matter. Um, so there is that associated with it. The other thing is increasing heat results from bare ground. So if you don't have um, organic matter in the soil and plants above the soil, you're not evapotranspiring water, um, which keeps, um, which, which results in solar energy not going to heating the land. If the solar energy goes to heating the land, then you get more uh, infrared being released in the, in the afternoon and evening, and more heat being released back, um, bounced off the blanket caused by the greenhouse gases back to earth. So more heat on bad ground is a bad thing. So on um, bare ground is a bad thing because it rapidly, as a, a twofold effect on, on climate change, rapidly lifting the heat of the local area. Um, increased heat, i.e. the tropics over vegetated ground uh, is quite good in the fact that it results in vast amounts of clouds forming and you get rain pushed inland a long way, such as the Congo and the Amazon, where you get rain up to 2,500 kilometres from the coast and 95% of that rain doesn't come from the ocean, it's just recycled locally. So that's a good thing. But the penetration of organic matter with the depth doesn't greatly happen because the turnover is so high at these warmer temperatures um, that you're getting some organic acids wash the, gra the groundwater, producing tannin and leaching the soil, but the vast majority of nutrients is taken into the system. Um, and so that means organic matter doesn't really humify in those systems. It tends to, to be um, concentrated on mineralization. Um, so it, it is a balance and understanding that balance is something that the, the farmer and the land managers um, and the park managers need to, need to consider and achieve and how they manage their landscapes with both fire um, as a tool and um, agricultural management as another tool. There you go, Nick, that's a pretty comprehensive answer. Um, Next question, given that carbon sequestration can reach a saturated state, so to say therefore has capacity limits, it would be reasonable to assume that carbon credit incentives will taper off relative to this reduction over time as soil sequestration moves towards its peak at a particular site. As such, do you think there is ability for current legislation to adapt to this change to maintain carbon credit incentives for stakeholders? Um, that's an excellent question. I suspect in the first period of 25 years, we won't hit saturation because it's taken us over 100 years to get where we've got, well, particularly the first 50 or 60 years to, to degrade the carbon. Um, there's a thing called hysteresis, which means we may not be able to go back at the same rate we came down at. 
Um, so in the first 25 years, I don't think it's a problem. In the subsequent 25 years, it might have hit the maxima, but the main driver for the farmer is you actually have so much improved long-term profitability and drought resilience associated with that soil carbon being there, that it really is worth maintaining. The second thing to note is it is possible to create small uplifts in your soil carbon by the additive of cation exchange capacity to, to be able to create more opportunities for storing carbon. And there is an opportunity to produce, to push carbon down with depth. At the moment, we're looking at one metre, but some researchers are looking at depths down to 10 metres. I'm not sure if that's particularly viable yet, um, but there is no doubt that there is interest in um, moving carbon beyond the 150 mil zone, beyond the 300 mil zone, down into the one metre zone. Um, and that will take um, longer than 25 years. So, um, this is still a very new space. The opportunities of sequestering it exist at least for 25 years before maxima start to be hit. Um, and, but then the opportunities of moving down the profile and other practices, I think, will, will come in, into being. But the bottom line is it's in the farmer's interest to maintain the, the increased humification because of the benefits in, in improved profit it gives. Okay, next question. As a lapsed environmental microbiologist, how can you promote the growth of fungi in soil relative to bacteria? So how do you promote fungi versus bacteria, Phil? Okay, um, that's why I put in, in, in brackets, uh, biodynamic solution 500, or at least an adapted version of that. Um, many of our systems are so degraded, you do actually have to... Um, bio-enhance some way or other. Um, otherwise, it takes quite a long time uh, to increase. So I'm all for an inoculum um, or 11. Probably 11 is a better way of putting it than an inoculum. Um, so one method that's done, and I've studied the science behind this, and people always laugh, but um, Steiner came up with the idea of burying a cow horn and, leave, uh, and putting into the cow horn some manure and leaving it in the ground for six months, get up into a tub of water. Um, the water can be straw soaked beforehand. There's benefit in doing that. So straw soaked for two weeks, putting the cow horn in, stirring it, um, and then within 24 hours, spraying it back over the same paddock the, cor the horn came from. Now everyone used to laugh at that because basically, and I'll take it in the sense of ridiculous, is that it was planted on the full moon, it's pulled out in the full moon, you dance naked around the full moon, I'll say the story went, which is not the case. Um, you got a wooden paddle and you stirred three times in one direction and three times in the other. So there was a little bit of razzmatazz, but the science behind it is quite interesting. So what you're doing is you're taking a piece of chitin, which is, contains um, polyaromatic and heterocyclic compounds, as well as quite complicated alkenes and alkynes, which, which is a way of saying quite a typical chemical structure. You put a bit of stimulant into it, a bit of manure, and you bury it into the paddock at which you want to lift it. The other way you can, microbes can break down heterocyclics and particularly poly, polyaromatics is to work together as communities. So, that it's, so it's known as co-metabolizing. So to co-metabolize, they've got to talk to each other and you know, fungi do the first bit, which is to oxidize the um, heterocyclics and, and the pHs. So they basically um, put a, what's known as a, a radical onto it. They radicalize it, which allows a group of uh, bacteria to um, put a hydroxyl group in, another bunch of bacteria to, to cleave the ring or to break the double bond and then start breaking it down. But they do all that whilst they're used to the local bacterial phages and fungal phages that exist. So these are viruses that attack them and can kill them. So they're adapted to those local conditions 
that exists, but they grow up in a favoured area to about 10 to the eighth, which is a huge amount of uh, microbial population. You then take that, put it in a microbial stimulant, which is the uh, T's are actually terpenes. Terpenes are a microbial stimulant. You mix it for less, you know, 24 hours or less because because fungi can't exist without oxygen. And then you spray it out in the paddock. So you and you put it out at around 10 to the 4 on the paddock. So that means that you've now grown up, a you've got a series of organisms from the paddock. You've trained them to work together on difficult environments. Um, you let the straw... Um, six months you let the paddock go to straw chop the straw immediately um, the day before you spray so you've now put on a whole bunch of um, a community of microbes that work together that can survive the local conditions that can break down complex organic matter and they go they go like all hell providing that the the balance in the water is balanced for cmps so that Steiner concept of burying a cow on has actually got great science behind it. So that's one way you do it. There's lots of other ways. Um, there's a test known as the underpant test where you bury a pair of underpants and you dig them up periodically and see how quickly they break down. Um, and the quicker they break down, the more fungi you've got in your system. So there's lots of easy ways of looking at it. But the way to get it sometimes is you actually have to introduce a leaven um, back over the landscape. You, you, sometimes nature needs a bit of a help. Anyway, I hope that answers the question. I'm probably boring for everyone else that went into the detail of it. But I love the fact that a, a system such as Steiner, which works at the system level, when you look at the individual components of biodynamics and break them down, you can see why some of those things work. Though the philosophy of Steiner may not appeal to you, the, the success of the system, the science of it, does work once you you, you break through um, some of the the gobbledygook that sits around it. Okay, so um, thanks for that question, Rob. You probably want to um, try some of them in the privacy of your own home before taking them out commercially. I would suggest, but um, no good answers there, Phil. Uh, one interesting thing that I've come across was RMIT was working on a sensor that was based on um, measuring the difference in the, elect the, the resistance to electrical flow across a, um, it was like a cellulose, which, which degraded um, proportionally to the biological activities that were in the soil. So in a sense, a bit like the underpan test, but with... Um, I guess a bit more precision to it through through applying that approach. So there are these various studies going on under that sort of thing. Um, next question, and, and I think we'll give it three more minutes. Is Phil able to tell us more about the ACU equivalent credit? What did that mean? Equivalent in integrity or value or an internationally traceable ACU? Right. Um... Vera is a register, so and it, it creates a standard. So Vera 0042 is the standard associated with soil carbon. We have chosen to offer to the market, and as a result of numerous requests, the Australian system of um, measure, model, measure with the integrity of the Australian system um, for those who want to trade internationally via Vera 42. So what it means is you use an international register, um, but you're using the Australian method in Argentina or Australia or um, USA or Canada or France, because people understand what that means and it and it follows a high integrity and it allows it to be traded at a own process internationally um problem with vera 42 or any of the of the standards as i said initially is exactly how the carbon's measured it can be highly variable as long as you can with the principles of the standard. 
So by offering an AccuE through Vera, people know that they're getting um, the Australian system, but it might have been out of Argentina or it might be in America. And on that basis, they know it's a high integrity carbon trade. Okay, next question. Could an independent farmer make a reasonable profit by increasing carbon in some of their less used, lower quality paddocks and claiming the offset certificates? Or are they better off focusing on improving their yields as a result of increased soil carbon? I can answer that question by saying, if there's $100, $50, $20 and $5 on the footpath, do you only pick up the 100 and walk away? Um, so the answer is, if you're going to the effort to make a change in your production system and introduce it progressively over a period of time, it makes sense to register the whole farm and go paddock and paddock at a time. The cost in measurement of a few paddocks compared to a whole farm is not substantively different. Yes, it's a slight increase, but it's not hugely different. The cost of running a project on a few paddocks to a whole farm is, is almost no different at all once you, you discount the measurement issue. Um, being able to include the, the lower performing paddocks in, into part of your farm management system rather than keep it separate does make it a lot easier in terms of overall farm in that they can be included as a basis. And the other thing to consider is in your if it's a rotational system um, that you're using on your, uh, sorry, it's a pastoral based system for your livestock, is that it makes sense to go to move your stock from your best performing area within three days to your low performing area because you can move phosphate around your landscape by the fact that it takes three days for a ruminant to shit out poo and if it eats high phosphate grass or highly nutritious grass um, or that's high in micronutrients and your poor performing land is low in micronutrients or low in phosphate, they shit out that to improve the paddock. So it's nice to consider your farm as a, a total system in which you can consider the benefits of moving in some way um, the uh, nutrients and micronutrients that are uh, higher in one paddock to a paddock that's lower. Um, so it, it's a kind of different thought, but it's a thought of looking at considering your farm as a system in whole, as well, the poor performers as well as the high performers, and then set the system up so that the high performers can help the poor performers. So I'm not greatly for splitting a farm up into a series of projects, because I think that makes it hard to manage the farm, it makes it hard for succession, it makes it hard for sale. So my view would be to consider the farm as one project. But that's not to say there aren't other views, it just happens to be mine. Okay, we're nearly done. So we'll, we've got three questions left. We might as well finish them off. God, is there anyone still be... there, Richard? <laughs> There's 60 people left. I think this is an absolute world record on the number of questions answered in one of our webinars. So, um, you know, thanks for answering them. Now, here's one more for you. Phil mentioned you get a proportion of your 20% permanence deduction back after 25 years when you prove it is still there. What proportion is this? I can't answer that question because I don't, don't yet know. Regulators are keeping some things up their sleeves, um, and that's one of them. They've moved that proportion. The 2018 method was 50%. The 2021 method is sorry, it was was 45% with a with a 5% um, for the reversal. The 2021 method dropped to 25%, and 20% being that that key component for permanence. Um, so I can't answer that question. The government 
is changing that as systems and uh, farmer understanding and uptake improves. So it, by the time we get to 2025, it might be as low as 10%. I don't know. And you might be able to claim the bit that the government's already held back. But certainly in the last three years, it's, it's dropped by half. Okay. Uh, Giuseppe is very appreciative and would like to learn more. That doesn't mean an answer, Phil. Next one, with what you just said, why can't an increase in soil organic matter be an indicator of an increase in soil organic carbon then modelled across the sample sites? I mean, soil organic matter um, is, made, yeah, is made up between somewhere between 0.4 and 0.55% soil carbon. Um, depending on a few other things such as um, chars and so forth. Yeah. So there's no reason at all that you can't um, run a Walkley Black that measures soil matter um, and compare it to a LECO method that measures um, soil carbon. Um, and but the estimate you get of soil organic matter um, by um, on the run methods across the top of the soil um, or by remote sensing um, still has a problem of having a high variance, i.e. an R squared factor between the actual number and what the, what the on the run meter is reading. So the problem is not that your organic matter can't be correlated with organic carbon. It's what is the sensor um, being remote uh, across the top of the paddock or in the ground is actually reading. Um, so yes, there is a direct correlation for property between um, organic matter and organic carbon and for every soil type on the property. So if you can break it down to that, you can get a high degree of accuracy. But by the time you've gone to doing all that, the costs of calibrating at that level means you may as well have measured. Um, so I hope that answers the question, but, but understand that organic matter is typically given a value of 0.45 um, um, soil organic carbon. It's interesting, you know, just to reflect on what you know, the way the world's dealt with this before, right? Like lysimeters in agriculture and you know, really understanding the processes and quantifying from those processes what happens and then extrapolating that out across broader areas. Given where we're at now, right? With technology to be able to sort of spatially extrapolate assisted by you know, spatial measurements from space, I would have thought that's going to be better than the variance you're going to have with all this soil carbon sampling and testing you're doing. Um, do you have a view on that? Look, Richard, I am quite comfortable that within 25 to 30 years, our databases will be big enough to rapidly calibrate um, um, sensor technologies, models that require very little sampling. Um, it's not there yet. And the, the databases we have are so minute. The knowledge we have of carbon moving down from 150 mil to 300 mil is not, not strong. And the models and the, the sample to calibrate those models aren't there yet. USDA are about to release a, a series of, of the DASSET model now calibrated to, to 300 centimeters on very limited number of farm activities. 300 millimeters, I mean. Um, so at this point in time, the database we have is too small to be able to use uh, modeling to trade with a low variance. But the market will decide. There's no doubt people will trade using modeling and they'll get paid a lower amount. Um, and the market at some point will decide the two are approximately equal. And at that point, the cost of measurements won't warrant um, the improvement in trade. 
So this is this in the end will be a market decided issue guided by the databases and the quality of the models de derived from those databases we have. In the moment, the databases are too small, too poor, not deep enough, not based on the science of flux rates, which we're, we're still grappling with at the moment. Macro porosity, for instance, and the impact of that, and its prediction of macro porosity in soil. So all those things um, are quite difficult. Um, and there's thousands of people worldwide working on this. The databases are starting to build up. And once they're there, the market will decide. But at the moment, it's a long way off. It'll be interesting to see how that all settles. Um, in terms of uh, two more questions, and then we're going to call it a day. Uh, very important question. What was your book shown at the start called? It was called Groundbreaking, Soil Security and Climate Change. It's a second edition is about to come out, which might just be called Groundbreaking. It should be available in bookshops in about two months. The e-book is still available online, but hardcover's not. Um, I have a, a couple of hundred of the first editions still left that I was taking around to ag shows and the like. Um, if they drop you an email, Richard, and with, with their address and you let me know, I can send, send them the details or they can go to the website, which is just called Groundbreaking, Soil Security and Climate Change. So if they go to that, it'll bring up the website and they can read a bit about the book. Uh, and get links to the different uh, ebook um, uh, uh, retailers, um, or they can get the details, and I'll just drop them an email and get their details and send them a, a book at, at appropriate remuneration, Richard. <laughs> um, so just just for everyone who's still here. There's a recording of this webinar that has Phil's contact details on the last page of this. So um, if you're wanting to chat to him more or get his book, that would probably be a good way to get started. Um, last question. This is a good question. Do you think globally soils have the capacity to hold all anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions and reverse climate change like some people claim? The short answer is no. There is a long answer. Um, and that's why I published the book. Um, the reason no is that there are two factors involved the two substantive factors involved in climate change. One is the blanket and the other is the heat source. The blanket is the greenhouse gases. Um, the heat source is how the earth deals with incoming solar radiation. Um, and it deals fundamentally, if you eliminate most of the side issues and, and what's bounced back into um, uh, the space, so all the solar radiation that hits the earth, 95% of it gets converted to two things. One is latent heat and the other is sensible heat. S latent heat is evapotranspiration. Sensible heat is heating the land. And when the land gets hot in the evening, it irradiates infrared. Now, solar radiation can pass through um, greenhouse gases or the clouds and, and the greenhouse gas layer. But infrared, a greater portion of it gets reflected back to the earth. Um, and that's what causes the earth to heat, but it keeps bouncing back. So the IPCC is focused on the blanket and you're gonna see the history of that written in the book and why. And they've ignored the heat source and all the models have ignored the heat source up until 2014, when they looked at the heat source on the inter-seasonal inter variability, but didn't look at what was the impact in changing the heat source. There was some modeling done by CSIRO in 2009 that looked at what happens if they kept CO2 at the same, 
land around southern Queensland continue to heat up? And the answer was it would. So reducing CO2 by sequestration won't account for all the CO2 that's gone up. But even if it did, it would not reverse climate change because we haven't addressed the heat source. Now, fundamentally, sequestering carbon to soil has the benefit of doing both. Not only does it remove CO2, it actually addresses the heat source by converting some of the sensible heat back to uh, latent heat, i.e. evapotranspiration. So, I mean, that's a Dorothy Dix to lead into the book if ever there was one, but um, that uh, issue is, is foremost is that we need to do three th things as a civilization. We need to stop, you know, reduce our emissions. We need to get CO2, out, or CO2 and other gases out of the atmosphere as much as possible, but we also have to address the heat source. And if we don't, then we will continue to result in climate change, albeit at a slower rate, if we only stop emissions. Um, so that's a, that's a kind of pessimistic view to finish, but um, saving the landscape uh, via soil carbon does actually have a huge impact on converting um, sensible heat back to latent heat. Very good, Phil. Um, we're gonna call it a day there. You have one firm customer here for a book. So we'll forward that on. I'm sure there'll be a lot more after this, but many thanks for your time. And I think it's a, it's a measure of your knowledge that we've still got over 50 people online listening and uh, really appreciate your time today. No worries. Thanks, Richard. And thanks to the audience for, for listening. To rabbit on a bit. Yeah. <laughs> All right.